Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at six o'clock. I'm Whitney Ward. And once again, we are switching things up. So I'm here at home. Mark is back at the Creme 2 studios. Mark, I have to ask you, it's been like two months since you've been there. How how is it feeling? Is it weird to be back? Yeah, I mean, it's good to be back, but it is strange because it's just so empty. I mean, I'm the only one standing in the studio right now. By the way, how's day two for you going at home? Day two is just fine. I think I've worked out some of the kinks and figured stuff out. I do want to forewarn people that my ginormous dog is inside the house. Yesterday, uh, I kept her out in the backyard, but since it's going to storm here in a little bit, <laughs> I brought her inside. So if she lets out some kind of ferocious bark, just no, no one's under attack. We're all okay. She's just greasy being greasy. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. And by the way, that's no exaggeration. <laughs> Whitney's dog is huge, by the way. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Whitney. We'll check back in with you in a moment. Spokane County applying for a waiver to reopen parts of our economy earlier, applying despite the fact that under current state guidelines, Spokane is simply too big to be eligible. So why go through with it? That's what political reporter Casey Decker asked the mayor today. He joined us live now with what she said. Casey? Well, Mark, the mayor, of course, has been leading the charge to get Spokane County a waiver. And this week, after a few unanimous votes, the application for it has now been sent to the governor. However, as you just mentioned, this application is only actually open to smaller counties, counties with fewer than 75,000 people and no confirmed cases for three weeks. Governor Inslee says different criteria will exist for larger counties, but local leaders say rather than waiting on those criteria to come out, they want to make it clear to the state, we think we're ready now. Well, we just wanted to be proactive in, in moving our economy along. That's been our approach since day one. That's why we've been having these conversations earlier, quite frankly, than I think a lot of other municipalities. Um, we wanted to open up that door, open up the conversation to advocate for our, our economy, advocate for our county, and get the governor to a point where he's open to listening to these kinds of conversations. You sit and wait around, you, you don't get a lot done. So we've been proactive in our approach every step of the way. Woodward also says the info we just sent to the state could be helpful in designing the criteria for larger counties to reopen. Today, the governor said he's still working on those criteria and he appreciates the proposal, but he didn't give any real opinion on it or provide a timeline for when the state might make a decision here. And it will, of course, ultimately be up to the state. Woodward says there's a lot riding on that decision, including the fate of many local businesses here. Mark. Casey, keep us posted on that one. Thank you very much. By the end of the week, there will be more than 1,300 people trained and ready to help with COVID-19 contact tracing all across Washington. The plan, according to Governor Inslee, is to be able to alert people who come into contact with someone with coronavirus within 24 hours of contact. Contact tracers, including those serving with the National Guard, Department of Licensing, and state and local health departments. We think of this as a, a smart weapon against this uh, this virus. It's smart because it's, it's located just to the folks uh, and targeted for the folks who are positive. And if it's successful, it will allow us to reopen our economy. The contact tracing is another step toward reopening the economy, as the governor just mentioned, and lifting social distancing restrictions across the state. Contact tracing is part of the process to stop the chains of transmissions, according to the CDC. So right now, Washington and Idaho both are still in phase one of four different phases for the states to reopen. Right now, Regina Ahn is joining us live in the newsroom to break down exactly what the coronavirus numbers are and where we stand when it comes to reopening. Regina? Well, Whitney, we want to make it easy to understand what's going on in our county, state, and of course our country. And here in Spokane, the first case of COVID-19 was back in March 14th. drive through testing became available late March. So with more testing, you'll see more cases. But before we get into testing, let's take a look at a graph of new cases and hospitalizations here in Spokane. You'll see the dark numbers here represent the confirmed cases. And of course, uh, since April 25th, Spokane County hasn't seen more than 10 cases. And you'll see the graph going this way, which closer to today. And so more than 10 cases and most were lower than five. And you can see the orange in hospitalization numbers. And you can see it's steady or to zero in most of the days. The light blue marks only three days over the past month that we've seen 
double digit cases April 11th, 12th and 24th. The orange bars track the number of reported hospitalizations each day in Spokane County. But you can also see this graph here that shows the curve going down. This tracks a 14 day moving average. The new cases being here and this is a pretty good uh, a graph for here in Spokane County. As Governor Inslee said, counties like Spokane could take weeks to move on to phase two. So let's get to Idaho next. And here's a graph that reports case numbers in Idaho. The peak total of cases in Idaho came on April 22nd with 222 cases. That's this bar right here. But within the last uh, month, we've only seen two, which is highlighted in, in orange, that we saw a rise in more than 50 or 100 cases. And you can see in the last couple of weeks, we've only seen that one highlighted in blue that exceeds the, uh, which is April 20, 20th, that exceeds more than uh, 50. So let's go to the next graph here that shows uh, the daily tracks confirmed cases going by a 14 average a day. We can also see the line that's projected to not only stay steady and flat in Idaho, but also drop considerably over the next 14 days, which is a really good, great news for Idahoans as phase two of reopening could begin in just four days on May 16th. And if certain factors are met and these graphs continue to show cases declining, restaurant, dining rooms, gyms, recreation areas, and hair salons could reopen if they follow the Idaho Idaho guidelines and I'm still looking into these numbers and tonight at 10 and 11 we'll track the testing in Spokane County and how it compares with other counties here in Washington. Live in the newsroom tonight, Regina on back to you. Well, they are certainly a telltale sign of warmer weather and summer on its way. Yesterday, we reported that Dr. Bob Lutz here in Spokane County said ice cream trucks should be considered as a food delivery service and would be OK. But now, according to Governor Jay Inslee, ice cream trucks are not actually allowed in phase one of the reopening plan, which is what we are in right now. The governor's office told us that ice cream trucks fall under the category of mobile food vendors, and that means they can't actually legitimately operate until phase two, which at this point would begin right around June 1st. So we will certainly keep track of that. Starting in phase two, some restaurants as well as taverns could partially resume some dine-in services. Now, under guidelines from the governor right now, dining rooms could open with uh, less than 50% capacity, but still no bar seating, no buffets or salad bars. Tables would need to be at least six feet away from each other and could only sit up to five people at each table. Restaurants right now also required to keep a log of everyone who dines inside the restaurant. That's to help with contact tracing in case someone comes down with the coronavirus later on. Customers strongly encouraged also to wear a face mask anytime they are not eating at their table. As of right now, there are eight counties we know of in Washington that are approved to move on to phase two, and that includes some right here in eastern Washington, Stevens, Garfield, Lincoln, Ferry, Ponderay, Columbia, Wakayakum, and Skamania counties all moving on to the next phase. Yes, I was surprised. I didn't think I qualified for a check, and uh, I got a check from my deceased mother-in-law in the mail. A North Idaho man reached out to Krem 2 after he received a stimulus check for his mother-in-law. The only problem, she passed away a year and a half ago. And he's not alone. People all across the country are reporting they've also received a stimulus check for a deceased family member. The IRS, it turns out, just updated their guidance yesterday on what you should do with that check. So tonight, we verify. And when you open it up and you read the name on it, what are you thinking? Uh, well, it says uh, her name and then the, has the four letters D-E-C-D after her name. And then it has my wife's name on it. And I'm saying, why would the government send a deceased person a $1,200 stimulus check when my, my son, who's disabled, hasn't got his checks yet? Mark Minnick says the $1,200 stimulus check showed up in the mail about a week ago. It was written to his mother-in-law who passed away in November of 2018. The check even included the letters D-E-C-D after her name, indicating the Treasury knew she was deceased. So Mark wonders why they still issued her a check. And I figure if it's computerized and the word deceased is on the check, the IRS must know she's deceased. So how did it get through any kind of computer screening to develop a check to start with. 
how many of these are going wrong, how many people aren't getting their checks. You'd think in this computer age, things could be just a little smarter. Turns out it's not a fluke. People across the country are reporting they've received a stimulus check for a deceased loved one, including Alice Gustafson and Cheryl Calm, both of Portland. How does my mom, who is not even living, get a stimulus check? You'd think that they would be careful. And within their own system, the first thing they would do is they would filter out people who are dead. So what do you do if you get a check for a loved one who's passed away? For this one, we turn to the IRS website, and it says you have to return it. Here's how. If you got a paper check, write void in the endorsement section on the back. Next, you need to return it to the IRS location listed for your state. If you've already cashed the check or the payment was a direct deposit, the IRS says you should send a personal check or a money order payable to the U.S. Treasury. Make sure to write 2020 EIP, include the taxpayer identification number of the recipient of the check, and a brief note about why you're returning it before you send it back. And if you filed jointly and your spouse passed away, unfortunately, the IRS says you need to return your spouse's portion of the check. I haven't done anything yet. As for Mark, questions remain. He wonders how many people will simply spend the money and if the IRS can even track the checks sent to people who are no longer alive. Yeah, I'd be very curious if how many millions of dollars might be going to people and what, whether they're getting the checks back or trying to cash them, where's the money going? So I spoke with a representative with the IRS today. Turns out if you live in Washington and need to return a check, you should send it to the Fresno Internal Revenue Service at 5045 East Butler Avenue in Fresno, California. If you live in Idaho, you'll send it to Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Internal Revenue Service there at 2970 Market Street, again in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So, well, let's move to weather now. We can expect scattered showers for the rest of the week around the inland northwest. Let's get straight to our Tom Sherry standing by in his home in the South Hill to tell us more about that. Tom? Well, the weather is changing. We've got a line of showers and thunderstorms just to the west of us. Would you please join me now and go over to the Krem 2 remote weather window again? Most likely you have some of these in your house as well. We'll take an observation together. And again, the cloud, boy, you know, it was sunshine during the four o'clock broadcast and man, oh man, the clouds have rolled in. You can just tell by the way the cloud cover looks that we've got storms headed our way. And that is certainly verified when we take a look at the Doppler radar imagery just west of Spokane. Uh, you can see a line of showers and thunderstorms across the region. And there you can see them right there. We had some thunderstorms out towards central Washington and now moving into the Palouse and now beginning to move into the panhandle of Idaho down around the St. Mary's area, southern end of Lake uh, Coeur d'Alene. There's a look at it. One of the good things is I, I would suspect that most people would agree that the thunderstorm component of this line of showers looks like it's decreasing now as we're getting later in the day. Uh, so we had uh, quite a few thunderstorms out to the west of us and then as this line of rain is we're seeing less and less thunderstorm activity and more just plain old rain, which is just fine. Uh, and we would look for most of the thunderstorm activity to decrease after sunset tonight and we begin to cool things down. We're, and we have cooled things down since uh, the five o'clock broadcast. We're at 57 degrees right now. We were at 59 then. So look for rain, possible thunderstorms tonight. Overnight rain, 46 the low, 64 the expected high on Wednesday with more rain and thunderstorms, especially for our viewers in Northern in Idaho. You're going to get more of it than say us here in Spokane and central Washington should be mostly dry. And then for the weekend, holy moly, look at that 74 on Saturday. Enjoy it. Get out, get your outside activities done because clouds and showers and thunderstorms show up again on Sunday. Mark, I'll have a look at your 10 day forecast coming up in just about 10 minutes. Looking forward to that, Tom. Thank you very much. Before we go to the break, want to give a shout out to all you seniors out there. Tonight we'll highlight Haley Greenwood. She's a senior at East Valley. We wish you the best, Haley. Keep sending in your senior photos. We love giving you a shout out. Just text 2020 to 509-448-2000 and we'll send you the submission link.